Good evening, good evening, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I see everyone's active in the chat. We appreciate your time and thank you so much for joining us. You will note that uh, this session, as you're seeing on your screen right now, uh, we have pre-tests and post-tests. Please, if you'd like to qualify for CMEs, we need you to um, do the pre-test and the post-test. The pre-test is currently being shared in the chat. You'll see a link that is being shared just now. Your email addresses um, are not necessary. We just need you to fill out um, the pretest and the post-test in the forms that are attached. So again, thank you so much for joining us. You have until 7 p.m. That is when the pretest will close. As is um, alluded in the name, it is a pretest. It is before we get underway with our presentation. So please attempt it now. And you can attempt it a number of times until you're satisfied with the score that you receive. And um, thank you very much. Please go ahead and do the pre-test just now.
Good night, everyone. Again, thanks so much for joining. For those who have just joined us, please note that we are sharing at the moment the pre-test link. The pre-test link is currently being shared in the chat. Please click on it and go ahead and attempt the pre-test and the post-test at the end of today's webinar so that you can qualify for your CMEs. So the pre-test and the post-test. Thank you so much. Just a reminder, we have about six minutes remaining in the pretest. Six minutes remaining in the pretest, which is now being shared in the chat. Please click on the link. It will take you to a Google Doc or a Google Form, and you can fill out the pretest there. And there will be a post test at the end of the webinar tonight as well. Looking forward to our awesome presentations. And we thank you for taking the time and joining us. So we have about six minutes remaining for the pretest.
Thank you so much for joining. It's 6.58. We close the pre-test at 7 p.m. So I have about two minutes remaining before we hand over to our moderator. Please uh, check the chat, click on the link there, and it will redirect you to the pre-test. And at the end of the session, after the last presenter is done, we will share the post-test. Thank you so much. So just about a minute left. I want to thank everybody for joining us from all over the world. Seeing that we have greetings here from Tortola. I'm seeing here where we have greetings from Antigua. Of course, we have greetings from all across the island of Jamaica. Um, thank you guys so much for taking the time out to join us uh, for this wonderful evening and this webinar uh, brought to you by the Caribbean College of Family Practitioners Jamaica chapter, Pediatric Cardiology. Um, healing young hearts. Uh, we're about to hand over and close the pretest and hand over to our moderator. Our moderator this evening will be Dr. Pauline Williams Green, and she will take us through a wonderful agenda uh, with three wonderful presentations. After which, uh, we will share the post test link so that persons can attempt the post test. Greetings from the Bahamas as well. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. We're looking forward to this evening. So I think time is just about up on our pre-test. It's 7 p.m. I hand over now to Dr. Williams Green, who will lead you through this evening. Have a great night. Thank you so much, Sam, Mr. Sam Heron. And thank you to all those who have joined us for this webinar. Sam. You have started you off, and as he said, I am Dr. Pauline Williams Green. I am the moderator. I am not Dr. Marvin Reed. So, welcome to all. We're looking forward to a fast paced but exciting, entertaining, but educative evening with our three wonderful pediatric con cardiac consultants. So um, and now before we get into our speakers, we will have the uh, prayer by Dr. Arlene Henry Dawkins, and this will be followed immediately by the welcome by Dr. Semi on the news show. Good evening, everyone. Let us pray. Dear, loving, heavenly Father, we thank you that you promise that where two or three are gathered, you are in the midst. Almighty God, we welcome you amongst us today and celebrate the gifts and the blessings you have lavished upon each of us. As we gather this evening, we welcome you, asking for your guidance, wisdom, and support as we begin this meeting on pediatric cardiology. Help us to engage in meaningful discussions as relevant and useful information is imparted by our esteemed presenters. We pray that you would deepen our comprehension, broaden our thinking, and transform our understanding of the topics to be presented. Show
shower our facilitators with wisdom and clarity of thought and communication so that we may fully understand all that we are taught. May we be empowered to use this information to effectively care for our little patients. Graciously bless the moderators, administrators, and sponsors of this conference as they execute their duties. May there be uninterrupted operation of all our equipment and a smooth flow of all the proceedings to ensure a successful conference. Pour a special blessing, Lord God, on all the participants and their families and bless them as they strive always to give their best to the persons entrusted to their care. We ask all of these through your precious Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in unity with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I think based on the moderators um, sharing earlier, we now head over to the uh, welcome and greetings by Dr. Seni Onanujo. Dr. Onanujo? Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Specially invited guests, doctors, Tamra Tomlinson Morris, Oluwayomi Oluguyi, and Sharon Forrester, moderator, Dr. Pauline William Green, distinguished colleagues, our sponsor, Indus Pharma and staff, IT support personnel, Mr. Samuel Heron, and Old Gate Solutions, the Caribbean College of Family Physicians Secretariat, headed by Ms. Lynn Thompson Hyatt. Friends, ladies, and gentlemen, a pleasant good evening to you all. This is our last webinar for 2022. And as we are all aware, the Caribbean College of Family Physicians has branches all over the region. Our mandate is to achieve and maintain excellence in the practice of medicine and the care of patients. This, to, to achieve this objective, the college has been assisted by the board members of the college headed by Professor Marvin Reed. The presenters from all branches of medicine, locally, regionally, and internationally, the IT support personnel, the secretariat, our colleagues who incessantly helped by supporting our activities, attending the webinars, and more recently, face-to-face -face and hybrid collaborative meetings. The drug companies who never fail to help with sponsorship and sometimes hosting of our webinars and at times a sourcing of speakers. Our moderators throughout the year who have always been willing to guide our proceedings to, to those persons who work behind, before, and between the scenes, we are deeply grateful to them as well. The college at this time would also like to recognize the various partnership that we have established over these last few years and their contribution to the growth of the college over the past year. Of, of notable mention is the Ministry of Health and Wellness, the Medical Association of Jamaica, the National Health Fund, Doctors for Change, JA, 
try the Jamaica, the veterinar Jamaica Veterinary Medical Association, and many others, too numerous to single out. The college at this the, the college at this time we appreciate all that have been this all that all these organizations and these persons have been doing. We thank them all and we pray and hope that we will continue to have a symbiotic relationship in the future. As the years draws to a close, we look to the future with much anticipation, expectation, and hope. Our children represent the future generation, and therefore it is only fitting that we are, we use this opportunity to focus on our young and vulnerable, as is evidenced by today's theme, healing young hearts. As such, we have a lineup of dynamic, well, we have a lineup of dynamic and exceptional speakers, also well accomplished, who bring a vast wealth of knowledge, wisdom, and experience in their respective disciplines. Dr. Sharon Forrester, Dr. Tamra Tomlinsey Morris, Dr. Oluwa Yomi Olubuyi. This trio of dynamic, dedicated doctors will enlighten us as we explore some cardiac related problems in our pediatric population and also some of the causes of chest pain as we look forward to learning from, their, from them about these topical issues. We welcome them all. A special welcome, a special welcome to our members who continue to support us despite the many challenges, numerous competing webinars, and other time-constraining activities. At this time, we are also reminding our colleagues of the Triennium Awards, which is MCCFP accreditation from January 1, 2020 to December 31, 2022. For further information, please call the CCFP Secretariat or visit the website at www.caribgp.org. On behalf of the college, I thank and welcome you all, and I invite you to sit back and enjoy the presentations. Thank you, and God's richest blessings. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Semi Onanujo. And Dr. Semi Onanujo, the president of the Jamaican chapter of the Caribbean College of Family Physicians. And I think she's given us a good start our, um, on our theme. She highlighted that the theme today is healing young hearts. And that's what we seek to do. And we're going to go immediately into our first speaker, Dr. Tamra Tomlinson. What an unusual name, lovely name. She will be speaking on congenital heart disease. But let me introduce her properly. Uh, Dr. Tamra Tomlinson Morris is a consultant in the Department of Pediatric Medicine and Division of Pediatric Cardiology at the Buster Mante Hospital for Children, good old Buster Hospital. She's a graduate of the University of the West Indies and completed a fellowship in pediatric cardiology at the Royal Brompton Hospital in London. 
She has expertise in the management of congenital heart disease in a resource challenge setting. She extends her reach by traveling the country regularly to assist with patient care. Dr. Tomlinson Morris is a former associate lecturer in pediatrics at the University of the West Indies. And she's a past president of the Pediatric Association of Jamaica. And she's a wife and mother and businesswoman. We welcome her, Dr. Tamara Tomlinson Morris. I remind you, you have 20 minutes. I'm very strict. <laughs> Looking forward to hearing from you. Please go ahead. All right, so I'll just go straight into it. I'd like to thank everybody, the organizers, for inviting me to this um, webinar. It's a very important and relevant topic. And after that prayer, nothing will go wrong. So congenital heart disease, what you should know. Okay. All right, good. All right, so what is congenital heart disease? So basically, this is heart disease that's present at birth. It affects the structure of the heart and how it works. There may be holes, narrowings, abnormal connections, missing or poorly formed parts of the heart. How common is congenital heart disease? It actually is the most common type of birth defect in children worldwide. About 1% of children, one in 100, are born with congenital heart disease. And of that one in 100, about one in four, are born with a heart defect categorized as critical congenital heart disease. And this means that generally these children have low levels of oxygen and they usually need some sort of intervention within the first year of life. That is in the best case scenario, first world settings generally, which we aim to, to get there someday. Common types of congenital heart disease. So just to go back to medical school a bit, we divide congenital heart disease into acyanotic and cyanotic conditions. Acyanotic have normal oxygenation and cyanotic has reduced oxygenation. And according to the CDC figures, the United States, the most common defect was the ventricular septal defect, followed by the atrial septal defect, pulmonary stenosis, patent ductus arteriosus, and aortic valve stenosis in the acyanotic category. In the cyanotic category, tetralogy of fallow, single ventricle defects, basically these are defects where one side of the heart is not formed, so one ventricle is the dominant ventricle, and transposition of the great vessels. In Jamaica, in 2012, um, one of our residents in training looked at the figures, and what we have were the most common acyanotic was ventricular septal defect, atrial septal defect, followed by the patent ductus arteriosus, and the most common cyanotic was tetralogy of fallow. So just to remind you what cyanosis is, it's basically blue or purple discoloration of the skin or mucous membrane due to insufficient oxygen in the blood. And it usually shows up when the oxygen saturation falls below 85%. However, it is very difficult and quite challenging to detect cyanosis in our population um, patients that ho um, have a higher percentage of melanin. So this baby that you're seeing here, if you look at the lips, you can see that there are a blue tinge. And another way to help you look at the eyes as well, and you look at the, you can compare using your own hands provided you're not cyanosed, and you can see sometimes the difference in the hues of the skin. So that's a way to try and, you know, determine whether the baby is cyanosed or not. And sometimes we notice or the doctor will notice, but then they'll put it off and say, oh, the baby's dark skinned. So another place you should also look is the tongue for central cyanosis. If you look at the tip, it might be purple. It might be what we call dusky or, or even a little bit more pale than what you had expected to be. So how do I or you recognize congenital heart disease? So I'm going to start in the hospital setting. So we must start with the history. Is there a pre, are there predisposing factors? A mother with diabetes mellitus, a mother who is on medication such as anti-epileptics, antipsychotics, all these are predisposing factors. And some people may be fortunate enough to have had an ultrasound that may have picked up that there is um, some abnormality, but this is um, few and far between. On examination, is there rapid breathing? Is there a rapid heart rate? What is the blood pressure? Is there a significant difference between the upper limb and the lower limb blood pressures? Are there murmurs? What is the size of the liver? 
And one important thing I want to point out is pulse oximetry. We really should aim to check the saturation of all babies before they leave the hospital. Um, usually what is recommended at three days of life, I know there are high turnover of um, patients post-delivery, but it's something that we really should aim to do and everybody should have a pulse ox. It's not just for COVID. Okay, and you usually check the right upper limb, which is um, which is standard, what we call standard, which is a pre-doctal saturation, any lower limb, which would be a post-doctal saturation. And the saturations that you aim to get on any child is greater than 95% of the child is term and greater than 91% of the child is preterm. Significantly, you may have a normal saturation, but if there's a more than 3% difference between the upper limb and the lower limb, it warrants echocardiogram and further evaluation. Why is this important? Why do we need to recognize these children early? So a landmark study was done in 2006 where there it was seen that 20% of newborn infants with critical heart malformations actually left hospital undiagnosed. And 55% of those were what we call doc dependent, dependent on the patent doctor's arteriosus, which connects the aorta, which is a big vessel from the heart going to the body, and also connect to the pulmonary artery, which is a big vessel from the heart going to the lungs. Now, this duct can work either way. So if there's a significant um, obstruction or reason why the body cannot be supplied, then the duct will supply blood from the pulmonary artery to the body. And if there's a significant reason why the pulmonary artery cannot be supplied, the duct will supply from the aorta to the pulmonary artery. And that's important because this duct closes. And then when it closes, we have our children presenting in extremis, in shock, or even in dead. But at the same time, patients that are diagnosed early generally have less morbidity and less mortality. So it's very important that we diagnose these children. So what should you not do? The murmur, you should not only rely on a murmur or on its intensity. So there are common benign neonatal murmurs that may present as early as day one and can disappear within a few weeks in many cases. And commonly these are the pulmonary flow murmur, tricuspid regurgitation, a lot of patients are born with a small VSD which actually closes, mild pulmonary stenosis, and of course the important arterial duct which we expect to close eventually. But conversely, there's significant heart disease that can present without a murmur, a large ventricular septal defect, core, 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 core triatriatum, all these fancy sounding names, total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage, transposition, hypoplastic left heart. All these things can actually present without a murmur. Although, you know, in some, a murmur may be present, but it's very important to have a high index of suspicion because a child, especially a newborn, you may not hear the murmur immediately. So you have to do other things. So a benign murmur, you have to distinguish between a benign and a pathological murmur. So a benign murmur in a newborn, usually there's a normal antenatal scan. There's no cyanosis or oxygen saturations are greater than 95% or 91% in the preterm baby. Um, remember we had mentioned the neonatal oxygen saturations. There is normal skin perfusion. There's readily palpable femoral pulses. And this is important because coarctation is actually quite common. And sometimes the only way you'll know a child has a coarctation is if the pulses, the femoral pulses are reduced or absent, or there's a delay between the radial pulse and the femoral pulse. And sometimes that's the only thing you get. So you should check. You should check the blood pressure as well. And there is, if it's similar upper limb and lower limb blood pressures or no great discrepancy rather, there's no tachypnea, no liver enlargement, a localized murmur, no diastolic murmur. A lot of times we'll get called and say, oh, the child has a murmur. When you ask, what is the respiratory rate? Oh, I don't know. Let me go and look. Okay, what is saturation? Oh, I don't know. Let me go and check. Right, so all these things need to be done. A child must be examined. So a pathological murmur, you may have had an abnormal antenatal cardiac sign for those who are fortunate to have that. We now have a lot more um, fetal... Um, obstetricians now that specialize in, in high-risk pregnancies. There may be cyanosis, desaturations, pallor, poor skin perfusion, reduced or absent femoral pulses, tachypnea, tachycardia, liver enlargement, and a loud second sound. So pay attention to the second sound. And like I said, the child may present in shock. So important facts. 
A significant number of children will present to the primary care physician undiagnosed, and the bulk of this audience are primary care physicians. And so it's important that we try to catch them from in hospital, but then if they don't get caught in hospital, then the primary care physician will be the first person to actually see them. So they do not only present in the newborn period. Again, in the same study that was done in 2012, it was shown that in the neonatal period, about 19% of these children presented. Infants from 29 days to one year of age, about 55% of them. And these are the children that are coming for vaccines and all of that. The preschool child, two to five years, was 17%. And the school age child, six to 11 years, was 9%. At Bustamante, remember, we stop at 12 years. And importantly, these children may present as emergencies. So recognizing congenital heart disease out of hospital, you must do a history. Is there a history of poor feeding, sweating, pausing with feeds? Does the mother give you a history of fast breathing? Now I highlight this because this happens all the time. The mother will eventually, the child will eventually come to cardiology after going to several physicians and she said, boy, that may tell everybody said the baby I breathe fast. And they said, that's how the baby's supposed to breathe. We should not ignore it. Remember periodic breathing, it's a more intermittent fast and then it goes slow, intermittently fast and then it goes slow. While with cardiac tachypnea, which we refer to as, it's usually a constant shallow type of respiration, but it's always present. And in some cases, you may or may not have recessions, but typically cardiac tachypnea does not have recessions. Is a child having poor weight gain? Mommy says eats a lot, wants to eat, but just can't gain any weight. Are there recurrent chest infections? Child shows up to your practice. The child says they were admitted in Spanish Town in, in February, then admitted at Boston in March, then admitted in, you know, Portmore, somewhere in Portland, you know, sometime in August. And a history of recurrent chest infections is a clear marker that you should suspect congenital heart disease. Is there poor exercise tolerance? A child is not able to do, keep up with his peers, not able to play with the peers, always short of breath. And some children, um, with cyanotic heart lesions may present with just squatting because as I said it's very hard sometimes to detect so if you're not checking for it you won't notice that the child is cyanos but mommy will say this is the older child usually he's always or she's always squatting. You should have been ob observing the child in, um, as the child came in whether in the mother's arms or on entering the room. Is this a marfanoid type of child a tall lanky basketball player type? Is this child syndromic? Now, Down syndrome, again, was highlighted here because this is the most common chromosomal abnormality, and 50% of children with Down syndrome will have a congenital heart defect. So any child that you see with Down syndrome should have a cardiac screen, an echocardiogram, um, where it's not immediately available, a chest X-ray and an ECG to give you a clue as to whether this child has a cardiac malformation or not. Is this child wasted? Is the child cyanose? What is the respiratory rate? What is the effort? What is the shape of the chest wall? Is there a precordial bulge? Is there an active precordial, meaning you can actually pull stations of the heart on the chest? Is there clubbing? Is there edema? Now, this side just reminds you of what some of these things look like. This child, um, extreme left at the top, is very wasted. This is a three month old and it's basically skin and bones. None of the chubbiness and the folds that you're used to seeing in a baby. This is an actual cardiac patient. All of them are cardiac patients. The child, the second child, this is a child with two things. Uh, you can see uh, trisomy 21 or Down syndrome features of same, but then look at this chest wall. This is a precordial bulge. This is a massive heart. All of this is this child's heart um, um, taking up the whole of the chest cavity. As you move down to the bottom, this is a cyanose child. Look at the tongue, it's almost purple. Look at the eyes, almost they're very injected. Uh, what we call plethoric, almost as if the child was crying, but it looks that way all the time. Look at the hands, that's clubbing, the drumsticking of the fingers. So these are some of the things that you should try to look at uh, when you see these children. Quickly, we'll go through palpation. You look at the pulse, the rate and the rhythm of the pulse. Is it weak? Is it normal? Is it bounding? Is there a collapsing pulse? A collapsing pulse also gives you an idea if there's you know, a possible congenital heart defect. It's really a high volume pulse. You check both femorals. You must check both femorals for the reasons I told you for coarctation. And coarctation is actually quite easily correctable. So it's something that really should not be missed. And you check the radiofemoral relationship. 
you look at the heart, the apex beat is the lowermost, outer, outermost point, um, outermost impulse. You check for dextrocardia. There are one or two children that will present with a heart on the right side. You describe the character, if it's thrusting, or is it what we call tapping, that you can feel it like somebody's knocking on your, your fingers, but through a door. Is there a thrill, like a water um, passing under your fingers? And again, check if there's a P2, a palpable P2, that can tell if there's some complication, which is um, pulmonary hypertension of some of a child with congenital heart disease. So quickly, that's how you check for collapsing pulse. You check the pulse. Um, you feel until you barely feel it. You lift the child, the, the hand up above the heart, the level of the heart, and then you should feel it bounding. You complete the movement by carrying the hand back down to the starting position. The second picture is that of a P2. I really should get a picture of myself doing the P2 here, but um, it's in the second space. And basically it's described like a, a second apex beat up at the second um, sternal space. Blood pressure, should check blood pressure where it's available. I know a lot of us don't have the pediatric cuffs, but where we do, after 20 minutes of rest, the pulse, the uh, sorry, the cut size must be 40 to 50% of the arm circumference. It should circle the and en circle entire arm. Four limbs were possible. Important point: the lower limbs are usually 10 to 20 millimeters higher than the upper limbs. So in coarctation, the lower limbs will be about 20 millimeters lower. So that's very important. And then these are checked against height centiles, percentiles, standards, um, up to 12 years of age. The heart sounds are heart sounds one and two actually heard? Are they loud or are they soft? Is there a systolic or diastolic or even a continuous murmur? So systolic murmur is between S1 and S2, boop, psh, boop. or a diastolic murmur, boop, boop, psh. or the best way to describe it is the absence of silence after S2. It can be very difficult, you know, without having experience or sometimes to pick up a diastolic murmur because they tend to be much softer than a systolic murmur. Or is there a continuous murmur where you hear um, the murmur throughout both systole and diastole? Um, and then also there are benign physiological murmurs. They're usually systolic, usually present in high output states. So if the child is having a fever, usually when the child is unwell, but there are no cardiac signs or symptoms. And the child has a normal chest X-ray and ECG. A chest X-ray does form an important part of the assessment of any child with a cardiac disease. Just to remind you what a normal chest X-ray should look like. This is a, a child with a normal chest X-ray. This child is supine, so it's, you know, not as not the best quality, but you can see some lung markings here. You can see the cardiac silhouette, all right? But in this child, there's pulmonary plethora. This is a child who probably has a significant left to right shunt, such as in a VSD, where there's a lot of blood flow going to the lungs. You can see the lung markings that extend all the way out to the periphery. You can even see the pulmonary artery, a prominent pulmonary artery here. And now this one um, to the extreme right, there's oligemia. Compared to the first and second one, you're hardly seeing any lung markings. And interestingly, this child has dextrocardio and what we refer to as a boot-shaped heart. So this would be like a child who has a tetralogy of fallow. Continuing recognizing congenital heart disease out of hospital then, the history and physical examination favoring a significant abnormality or a pathological murmur would be feeding difficulties, poor weight gain, recurrent chest infections, tachycardia, tachy tachypnea, poor skin perfusion, liver enlargement, low P2, desaturation or cyanosis, shock, abnormal chest X-ray, abnormal ECG. For the purposes of this presentation, I did not really go into ECGs. But note the chest X-ray and ECG may not be useful in the first few weeks of life. But the take home point here, once a pathological murmur is suspected, refer. If you're unsure, refer. So clinical case scenario one, this is a two month old who presents with a one week history of not feeding and worsening shortness of breath. Mother reports the infant always sweats and catches breath when feeding. She was told the baby was fine at the six week visit. On examination, the infant is wasted, tachypnic and tachycardic with normal saturations. The liver span is six centimeters and tender and chest X-ray shows cardiomegaly with plethoric lung fields, pretty much like this baby that we're seeing here. And this is a classic presentation to the a &E, to the family practitioner, to the pediatrician of cardiac failure, which is, and this is the most common manifestation of congenital heart disease that will be seen. So what can you do? Essentially, you can do a head up position. You can do food restriction until the child is established on diuretics. 
um, if they're available, and of course you refer. And what is a presentation without an echocardiogram picture? So this is the ventricular septal defect here, a big hole um, between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. And there's a, some smaller defects at the bottom as well. And that is a ventricular septal defect. And the patient before had a ventricular septal defect. And that is actually a recent case that we saw. Similarly, another case that we saw recently, clinical case scenario two, is a 21-month-old male presenting with a history of increased fussiness, high-pitched crying, um, decreased activity and turning blue over the past 24 hours. Mother gave a history of patient turning blue since infancy when he cried, but seemed otherwise well. She reported that a murmur was actually heard at his six week visit, but she did not do the follow-up investigations that were recommended. On examination, patient was cyanosed, clubbed, lethargic with, la with labored respirations and saturations of 50%. No murmur was heard. And this is a classic presentation of a hypersyanotic tech spell. So in this case, you would not have heard a murmur, but this child has classic symptoms. And the murmur is heard because the narrowing is so significant. So no blood flow is going to the lungs. So what can you do? You keep the child calm. This is one situation where you want to keep the child calm. You try to avoid sticking if you don't have to. Um, you do the knee chest position, and that helps with improving blood flow back to the heart. If available, and if you can, you could do an IV fluid bolus and of course refer. And this shows what the pulmonary artery would look like in a patient with tetralogy of fallow. In the right, this is a normal pulmonary artery with the two branches going off to the lungs, nice and patent, nice blue flow. On the left, you can see there's turbulence, called turbulence, so that's the mixing up of the colors here. And you can see it's a very small and narrow pulmonary artery and very small and narrow pulmonary artery branches. And that is what is happening when, this, when the child is in a spell and it clamps down even further, there's little to no blood flow that goes to the lungs. So in conclusion, congenital heart disease is the most common congenital abnormality in children. It's classified as cyanotic or acyanotic, ventricular septal defect and tetralogy of fallow being the most common respectively. Early detection improves outcome, morbidity and mortality. Pay attention to the history as well as the examination. Don't just check for a murmur. Do your saturations and it's recommended that every physician does have a pulse oximeter. In emergencies, you can do minimal intervention until hospitalized. And of course, you refer. So references are available upon request. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tamara, Thomas, and Maurice. You ca carried us on a train ride just now. <laughs> and such a refresher, the cyanotic and acyanotic types. So there'll be lots of questions I know. And that will be in the Q&A when we have lots of time for that. So we're going to jump from one coach to the other. And in this section, we're going to have Dr. Oluweomi, Olubui. I am hard, working hard on the names. Um, Dr. Oluweomi is a consultant um, pediatric cardiologist as well. We don't have his, uh, his um, CV, but I know he's going to introduce himself very briefly and introduce us to, I see his title, Kawasaki disease and multisystem inflammatory disease. Take it away, Dr. Olu. Take it away. Hello, um, everyone. Good evening. Um, it's wonderful to see uh, I'm thankful to the um, Caribbean College of, of Family Physicians for inv inviting me to this presentation. Um, probably need to show my picture. Right. Uh, um, it's wonderful that we have a lot of participants um, very unexpectedly, but um, I'm grateful for this um, opportunity. Um, I'm a pediatric pediatrician and a pediatric cardiologist as well. Um, I, did my MBBS in the University of Ibadan and then um, pediatrics at the University of the West Indies. And I did um, pediatric cardiology in 
uh, University of Alberta, uh, Thoroughly Hospital. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about Kawasaki's disease, a multi-system inflammatory disease. I have um, told 30 minutes, but I understand it's 20 now. So um, I'll try and see what we can get through, given that these are really broad topics, but we'll basically just focus on specific things. Um, okay. Right, so the objective of this is really to have an introduction, talks a little bit about the epidemiology of Kawasaki's disease, its clinical presentation, and we'll touch very briefly on um, a multi-system inflammatory disease and now have a short summary. So starting off, so in patients with Kawasaki's disease, it basically occurs in children six months to five years in 80% of cases. Um, so emphasis is 80%. So what happens um, to the others? Other, others. Um, so you, you can have them uh, cases outside of the um, five year period, meaning you can have older children presenting with Kawasaki syndrome, but you can also have um, um, younger children, younger than six months with Kawasaki disease. And so why do we worry about this condition? Mainly because of the high significant complication rates when not treated early. So the annual incidence of Kawasaki is um, 4 to 15 per 100,000 in children five years and older. Uh, it's overrepresented in Asian Americans and generally in Asians and also in African-Americans being the next most prevalent. Uh, there's a seasonal variation, but it generally tends to occur between September and um, April of most years in most countries. Um, and the primary goal of your primary care physician is really to early case identification for uh, referral, understanding the needs for follow up, needs for immunization post Kawasaki treatment. Um, Um, jumping straight into the diagnostic criteria, fortunately, we've got gui guidelines. So in thinking about Kawasaki's disease, the Japanese were the first, uh, uh, Thomas Sako Kawasaki was the first to identify this condition. So they have an extensive research program about Kawasaki and good guidelines. Some of the guidelines are related to um, their own specific population. But if you look at both guidelines from the Jamaic, uh, Japanese as well as the American Heart Association, they're actually quite similar. In the Japanese group, they looked at six criteria. The American Association looked at five. Um, of the six criteria, fever is noted to be part of the six. Uh, with the Americans criteria, fever is expected, and then they expect five, uh, four or, or more um, conditions. In, in the Japanese, they want five of six criteria in terms of guidelines for diagnosing Kawasaki's disease. And this is just looking at this, the American Heart Association diagnosis of Kawasaki's disease. And uh, as I said, they wanted four, at least four of the five principal clinical features of Kawasaki's disease. Um, the changes that we expect include uh, extremity changes, where we'll, um, they have erythema of the palms and soles, as well as edema of the hands and feet. And uh, that's usually in this acute phase, acute phase meaning usually in the first 10 days or first two weeks. And um, subacute phase, usually it's two weeks, two, week, week two and week three, um, you, they have period of uh, peeling at that time. The next ch chain that may occur is a polymorphous exanthem. Um, usually it might be a diffuse maculopapular rash, urticaria erythema kind of rash, but they never really have vesicular or bullous rashes. And um, another criteria is really bilateral bulbar conjunctivitis without exudates. Um, and um, they do have lip changes as well with cracked lips, strawberry tongue, uh, diffuse injection of the oral and pharyngeal mucosa. And um, last but not the least is um, cervical and lymphadenopathy, usually 1.5 
uh, in diameter and usually unilateral. Unilateral does not mean singular. Uh, there might be multiple nodes, but on one side. Um, and finally, with, we have to exclude other diseases with similar findings, such as viral infections. And in places where you, they still have measles, most places we don't, vaccination has eliminated that. Scarlet fever, we still have that with us. And then we do have uh, adenoviral infections, which um, uh, Stephen Johnson syndrome, um, toxic shock syndrome. Um, so the major difference really between the Japanese and the uh, American heart surgery is that fever you know, for five days is expected to last for five days for the criteria for the American um, heart association criteria to be filled while the Japanese criteria does not require that. So maybe shorter duration of fever. Now, in terms of phases of disease, the acute phase may last from, like I said, one to two weeks from the onset. Uh, usually these children are febrile, they're irritable, they appear toxic, they have oral changes, rash and edema, as we've said during this phase. And in the subacute phase, discrimination may be present and they may have persistent arthritis or arthralgia and um, have an antalgic gait. Um, they have, and they may gradually improve even without treatment and convalescence may take months to years without treatment. Um, with regards to the fever, um, the fever is usually very abrupt in terms of its onset it's unremitting without any response to antimicrobial, hardly response to anti-inflammatory, um, sim simple um, uh, uh, acetaminophen either. Uh, usually may, <coughs> and the fever may not be accompanied by mucosal inflammation. Majority of the children will have fever lasting for more than five days, although the figure is arbitrary. Uh, in Japanese cases, fever, like I said, is not taken as a prerequisite. And um, there are a few cases of fever that have been reported. Um, Sam, did we lose him or is he still online? He's still online. I think he received a call and then he dropped off. So yes, he's actually gone. Now. Right. All right. Okay. Um, I guess he'll try to get back on or you have his contact on him. He needs to put on back his slides. Fine. Uh, yeah, let me try and get him uh, one moment, please. All right. Um, these things do happen. That must have thrown him off. Let's just give him a few minutes. Just while we wait, maybe I could ask one of my questions um, to Dr. Tamara Tomlinson Morris. Are you near the mic now? Great. Yes, I'm still here. Yes, great. Let me ask my questions early, mm -hmm. which is the, about the pulse oximeter. Mm -hmm. um, what are your findings or are, are there any studies on the use of pulse oximeters that we buy you know, anywhere on people with high melanin, the uh, babies with high melanin? No, the, the, the pulse oximeters seem to work fine in, you know, um, Caucasian and non-Caucasian or brown and black people is now the correct term that they say. Um, the main concern I think with them is, especially in the babies, is really the, the size of the fingers and the size of the toes. And so sometimes the tracing may not be as strong as you would like it to be. So the neonatal ones tend to be a lot more expensive, um, but they, they're accurate with the, you know, brown, black, white. Okay, good to hear. All right, good to have you back, Dr. Luweomi. I think you'll have to share your screen again. Is that right, Sam? What you said, You're muted. You're muted, Dr. Can you hear me? Yes, now we're here. Will you have to share your screen again? Okay. 
Okay, let's see. Let's see. Share screen. Share that. Can you see the screen? Can you see the screen? Can you hear me? Yes, we can I, see and hear you, Doctor. Yes, okay. I'm sorry, I was muted. We're hearing, we're hearing you and seeing you. Please go ahead. All right, sorry about that. Um, so, in terms of the fever, like you said, it, it's um, usually abrupt in onset, and um, and a few cases have been reported in Japan in Japanese um, children where fever not, was not noted, and experienced clinicians should be maybe able to diagnose this, even with um, three or four days of fever. With regards to the extremity changes, like I said, it's really the edema that occurs is usually a non pitting type edema of the hands and the feet. Um, and they usually transit occurs within a few days in the acute period and, and goes away. Uh, later on, it, the periangal skin changes is part of monic of uh, Kawasaki's disease and it appears two to three weeks. So usually it's a thick, um, Discommission that you do have rather than thin discommission seen. In Indians, it can occur early and with less than 10 days. Uh, with regards to rash, um, the rash is polymorphous in appearance, appear within a few days, um, and occurs in up to 96% of cases. Um, and this is just showing the uh, swelling and the rash that does occur and this is a peeling that one could do see in this acute phase of Kawasaki's disease. Um, diffuse erythematous rash that we see um, is, is shown here as, as well as um, and conjunctival involvement usually it's bilateral spares in limbus uh, without exudates being um, quite diagnostic and it's seen in 89% of cases and this is just showing the, um, over here we have the strawberry tongue and we have very red lips and you can see the um, conjunctival area that is erythematous. And when you look really at this perilimbal area, you can see a little bit of clearing, uh, which is the perilimbal clearing. And that usually gives you an idea but this may be Kawasaki. And of course, uh, severe calidinitis is one of the um, less common um, signs that we note in about 60% of patients with Kawasaki's disease. Um, and it's not separative, unlike a bacterial um, infection causing separative lymphadenitis. Um, the other thing we do see is are those with atypical Kawasaki's disease. Uh, they usually um, present with less than five, usually two to three of the diagnostic criteria. We need compatible laboratory findings um, and they do still can develop um, coronary artery aneurysm. Um, we still require no ex ex other explanatory disorder for the, for the presentation and is occurs commonly in children less than one year of age. So why do we miss Kawasaki's disease? Well, as I have alluded to, it's a diagnosis of exclusion, but because we're thinking about so many other diagnoses, bacterial infection, viral infections, uh, uh, um, we tend to generally, and that's the usual pattern that we see, is that a child is thought to have a throat infection, antibiotics are started, rash develops. Um, the physician thinks that the rash is related to or is triggered by the antibiotics that was given. This results in um, probably switching antibiotics. Time is going, it gets to five days. Child does not seem to be responding to the antibiotics. Then the penny probably will drop and we'll probably will start thinking, is this something else? What are we missing? Uh, another problem is that sometimes they do have a myotitis. Um, they may present with urotritis and we may suspect that they're having a urinary tract infection because the inflammation occurs everywhere, really. Um, we may be thinking it, it's a urinary tract infection and may go down that path. Uh, because this 
clinician is almost a protein in terms of its presentation in the acute phase. We generally tend to think about um, infectious conditions rather than inflammatory conditions. And inflammation, as we know, is the problem in this case. The problem with Kawasaki is that sometimes it overlaps, there are overlaps with um, infectious conditions and that's been reported in the literature. Um, we can have respiratory infections or uh, respiratory symptoms, uh, and they may also sometimes bring gastrointestinal symptoms as well. Uh, uh, and these are things that lead us to the wrong guiding path. So what happens when we do miss it? Well, if we do miss it, it's really about the cardiovascular consequences. Cardiovascular consequences that we really are concerned about is coronary artery dilatation and its associated complications. If it is untreated or treated late, then 15 to 20% may develop coronary artery changes. And you might ask also, why is coronary artery changes important? Well, those coronary artery changes involve dilatation of the arteries with dilatation in sluggish and sluggish blood flow in those particular vessels from bosses may develop. Uh, and, but if you do catch them early, and of course do appropriate intervention, then uh, three, only three to 7% of them may develop um, this changes and some people will actually post less figures than this. Um, where did the problem occur? Well, it's more commonly in the proximal portion of the left main coronary artery, and then followed by a left anterior descending and then the right coronary artery. Um, other cardiovascular manifestations may be well, they may have nothing, no cardiovascular manifestations. So the majority of the patients will not have coronary manifestations, especially once they are treated early. Sometimes the manifestations may be suggestive of myocarditis, where you do have patients with tachycardia, normal gallop, um, disproportionate to the degree of fever and anemia that they may have. In other cases, they may have problems suggestive or symptoms suggestive of pericarditis that may occur in 25%, although the symptoms are real. You may have pericardic friction rub, and tamponades have been known to occur, uh, as well as distant heart tones. Treatment is really IVIG as a one-term dose, but I'll really simplify this. Sometimes treatment can be really complicated. Um, and the mechanism of action is unclear, as we do not, are not even a clear, uh, clearly aware of the cause of Kawasaki. Um, but they, we know that given IVIG causes a significant re reduction in coronary artery aneurysm in patients who are treated uh, with IVIG. Uh, aspirin, we don't think really contributes much to the, diff the um, improvement. Okay, next I'm going to go on to multi system inflammatory dis disease. Um, well, this, this condition was first um, highlighted in patients who, um, since COVID uh, in children and first reported, I think, in, in 2020 uh, when COVID became um, prevalent. Um, and we do have a, a CDC criteria. Um, for this, it mainly revolves around fever, inflammation of organ systems. The fever is usually equal to or above 38 degrees, lasting for more than 24 hours. But they have an hyperinflammatory state, so the laboratory evaluation is usually helpful with elevated ESR, CPK, sorry, C-reactive protein, D-dimers, ferritin, lactic acid, and all the others listed elevated leukocytes and lymphocytes as well, and low albumin. Most of this we could get in most of our labs. Um, the multi-organ involvement involves about two or more organ systems, like a renal, cardiac, respiratory, hematological, gastrointestinal, also dermatological or neurological. Um, they must have no alternative diagnosis to um, multi-organ inflammatory, uh, systemic missy uh, patients may also meet the criteria for CASA. Okay, so the, the, there might be an overlap of those two conditions, and there is a need to, to have um, a recent 
early diagnosed SARS-CoV-2 infection, either by um, the rapid test, which is on a nasopharyngeal PCR or the antigen test of a serological test. Well, so this cartoon just shows that there may be fever, although it could be absent, especially in neonates. Uh, they may have um, cardiovascular dysfunction, like I stated, uh, respiratory dysfunction. In most of the time in children, what we've noticed is that the cardiovascular dysfunction is usually very, or manifestation is usually very mild, um, um, but, um, this, uh, and it's usually related to, again, to coronary uh, dilatation, but um, sometimes they may have depressed ventricular function as well. In addition, there may be neurological impairment, acute kidney impairment, gastrointestinal and respiratory disorders and mucocutaneous abnormalities, all in the presence of confirmed or, sus or suspected SARS-CoV-2 exposure. So with regards to the cardiovascular complication, is basically similar to Kawasaki's disease. And treatment is mostly supportive, um, uh, especially if the respiratory, if there's respiratory involvement. And we usually give intravenous methyl prednisone, IVIG, or acrine in that sequence um, to see whether there's significant response. Um, so in summary, Kawasaki's disease is a missing result of similar complications in children prompting Early recognition is important. Prompt and early recognition is important with appropriate referral. And thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Dr. Olu Naomi. Um, Olu Biwi, you survived a bit of bump in the road <laughs> or on the train track, but you carried us safely. And we are much wiser for the information you have shared with us. So we look forward to the questions and I'm sure there'll be many later on. So uh, we're going to move on now. Um, my program um, said that there was a sponsor's presentation. Just check in with, um, with Lynn or Sam. Is there any presentation by any sponsor uh, before I go on to the third? presentation. Yeah, we have a sponsor's presentation right now and we'll go ahead and let them go. Welcome to the world of Indos. And we are happy to join hands with you to serve the humanity across the globe through innovative healthcare brands. In just 16 years, Indus has grown from 1 to 120 products in 12 therapy areas. Today, Indus has spread its wings globally and is now present in 30 countries with 150 professionals spread across geographies like Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, Europe, Caribbean and South America. Excellence is not an act but a habit at Indos. Our world-class products, affordable pricing, excellent supply chain, strong field force, and good business practices have accredited Indos with many excellence awards, like Federation of Indian Export Organizations Export Excellence Award, Farmexcel Award, Brand of the Year Award in Ghana and State Bank of India Financial Discipline Award. What's more, now Indus brings you a five minute miracle. In today's fast and modern lifestyle, the incidence of heartburn due to acid reflux and GERD is alarming due to stress and busy schedules, overeating, eating irregularly or too quickly, eating just before bedtime, fatty, spicy and fried junk foods, caffeinated drinks, carbonated soft drinks, acidic juices and alcohol, and 
and smoking. As published in many international journals, hyperacidity, acid reflux and GERD lead to heartburn. In hyperacidity, the excess acid from the stomach can move upward into the esophagus, known as acid reflux. As the lower esophageal sphincter, which joins the esophagus and stomach, becomes weak. Since the esophagus is not well protected like the stomach, the acid can irritate the lining and cause inflammation in the esophagus. This causes painful symptoms that can last for a few minutes to hours and can occur more frequently within a week. This chronic form of acid reflux is known as GERD, that is, gastroesophageal reflux disease. The major symptoms of heartburn due to acid reflux and GERD are a burning feeling in the chest, epigastric pain, a bitter or sour taste in the mouth, nausea after eating, regurgitation, frequent burping, flatulence and gas, stomach discomfort, difficulty in swallowing, sore throat and dry cough. The question now is, do regular antacids help? In hyperacidity and GERD, regular antacids can only neutralize the acids, leaving acid reflux unattended. To treat hyperacidity, acid reflux and GERD, Indus Life Sciences comes with a unique third generation antacid named NuGel, which controls acidity, prevents reflux. NuGel offers balanced combination of alginic acid, magnesium hydroxide, dried aluminum hydroxide, magnesium trisilicate, and dimeticone. When a person takes NuGel, the raft forming alginate physically blocks reflux through a unique mechanism. When alginic acid comes in contact with the gastric acid, the raft forming alginate, which includes natural algae, begins to form a light but strong foam barrier known as raft. This raft floats on top of the stomach contents and prevents acid from moving upward to the esophagus. The alginate raft formula containing balanced antacid components offers a speedy onset of action in less than five minutes and provides rapid relief from acid reflux with effective neutralization of stomach acid. New gel has long-lasting effects up to four hours since the raft can be retained in the stomach for several hours. Dimeticone in new gel is an anti-foaming agent it reduces the surface tension of gas bubbles, causing them to combine into larger bubbles in the stomach, which can then be passed more easily by means of belching. Dimeticone thus relieves flatulence. New gel is recommended in hyperacidity, GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, gastritis, flatulence, and as an adjuvant to NSAIDs. New gel is available as New Gel 200 ml suspension and New Gel tablets with delicious mint flavor. New Gel is safe in pregnancy. New Gel is sugar free, hence safe for diabetics. For patients with symptomatic pain due to gastric and duodenal ulcer, Indus also presents New Gel O, the alginate raft forming antacid with mucosal anesthetic agent oxeticane. Oxeticane is a potent, safe, local anesthetic agent that provides prolonged anesthesia of mucous membranes, thereby offering prompt and prolonged relief of pain. NuGel O is available in 200 ml suspension with mint flavor. NuGel and NuGel O. Raft formation reduces intensity and frequency of reflux attacks. Works in less than five minutes. Offers long-lasting effect up to four hours. Sugar-free, hence safe for diabetics. Delicious mint flavor improves patient compliance. We thank the entire medical fraternity for supporting Indus in our journey towards better health care.
Amino Pep Fort in Pedia. The WHO and UNICEF report highlights good nutrition allows children to survive, grow, develop, learn, play, participate and contribute. Nutrition including protein in the form of amino acids play an important role for both physical and cognitive health. Undernutrition in children can lead to weight loss and low immunity. This in turn leads to increased susceptibility to infections which results in loss of appetite, loss of nutrients, malabsorption causing undernutrition. Hence the vicious cycle of undernutrition in children can prolong school absence hampering the academic performance. As per eBioMedicine, stunted growth in children coincided with lower serum concentrations of all essential amino acids like tryptophan, isoleucine, leucine, phalene, methionine, threonine, histidine, phenylalanine, arginine and lysine compared to non-stunted children. Amino acids in therapy highlights growth development and function depend on the correct supply of amino acids. To build a strong immunity and growth in children, Indus Life Sciences presents Amino Pep Fort. Amino Pep Fort is a 10 on 10 combination of 10 essential amino acids fortified with multivitamin and zinc in a delicious syrup. The 10 essential amino acids meet the increased demand during infections. Reputed journals like Genes and Nutrition 2017 highlights that essential amino acid supplementation enhances muscle protein synthesis, physical endurance and increases immune function. The British Journal of Nutrition highlights vitamins and trace elements like zinc also assist in protective activities on immune cells and are essential for antibody production. Nutritional benefits depend on the quality of protein, which is assessed by essential amino acids, composition, digestibility, and bioavailability of amino acids, the protein efficiency ratio, biological value, and net protein utilization depends on essential amino acids content. Amino Pep Fort offers free form of all the essential amino acids which are immediately absorbed into the body and needs no digestion. Amino Pep Fort strengthens immunity and prevents infections and ensures an active and healthy childhood free from diseases. Thank you to our sponsor, Indus. And we will thank them some more later on. We're now ready for our third presenter, and that is Dr. Sharon Forrester. She is a graduate of Holy Childhood High School. And after leaving high school, she obtained two undergraduate degrees. Um, a BSc with first class honors in maths and chemistry, and of course her MBBS at the University of the West Indies, Mona. She went on to do her postgraduate degree in, in pediatrics, and this was in 2007. And later on, she did her fellowship in pediatric cardiology at the Royal Brompton Hospital as well. So they both know each other. She currently works at Boston Mante Hospital for Children, also a consultant pediatric cardiologist. So we have the entire Boston Mante team here, it seems. So we just welcome them and we look forward to this topic. And we're holding on to our chairs here because this is surely going to be exciting as she takes us into the end. Uh, you do have 20 minutes or the best part of that. Chest pain in children, 
Thank you, Dr. Sharon Forrest. Um, <clears throat> good evening, everybody. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to do this uh, presentation on chest pain in children. Um, please forgive me if I lose connection. I'm getting a signal that my internet connection is poor. Um, not my fault, that's no. So let me proceed. Why is my slides not moving? Give me a sec. So the objectives of this presentation um, include, we look at the causes of chest pain in children, the non-cardiac versus the cardiac causes, pay more attention to the cardiac causes of chest pain. Um, look at how we diagnose these cardiac uh, chest pains. Um, we're looking at our history, physical examination and investigations. And we look at some pointers as to when do we need to refer a patient presenting with chest pain to the pediatric cardiologist. Please go ahead, Dr. Farso. We are hearing you. Yes, it's just that my screen is just not moving. Okay. Um, so just a reminder of the, the chest cavity. I know you all know this, but the, the, the chest is made up of the chest wall and its various components, skin, muscle, cartilage, and the organs and, and vessels and within that chest wall cavity. So chest pain can originate from any one of, of these um, components of the chest. So looking at um, this paper that was published this year by Sanghera et al, um, in progress in pediatric cardiology. What they did, they looked, did a large scale systematic review of studies from 1950 to 2010, compiling the causes of chest pain in pediatric patients. And what they found was that the majority of patients presented with what is called idiopathic chest pain. That is chest pain that has no known cause. After investigation, um, evaluation, no cause was found for the chest pain. This was followed by musculoskeletal causes in approximately 20%, psychological causes, 16%, gastrointestinal causes in 10%, and cord cardiac causes in nine, um, approximately 10% of patients. This is the largest um, number of, of um, that I've seen in, in um, the studies published in the smaller studies, cardiac causes of chest pain are usually less than 6%. And in their, their study, they also found respiratory causes in 8% um, percent of patients. Now the cause of non-cardiac chest pain is wide and varied, as I showed you the, the reminded me of the anatomy of the chest. Um, so I will just put them on the musculoskeletal causes. There may be respiratory causes, gastrointestinal causes, and miscellaneous um, um, causes such as psychogenic um, hyperventilation. Now, in the interest of time, I will not be focusing on the non-cardiac causes, but we'll try and give you tips in your, in your history to, um, as to the red flags which indicate that this may be a cardiac chest pain. So just to look at some of the cardiac causes of pediatric chest pain, inflammatory um, is one of the common causes of chest pain. 
um, resulting in either pericarditis, a myocarditis, or a myopericarditis. So you have a combination of both. Pericarditis, inflammation of the pericardium, resulting in um, a pericardial effusion, myocarditis, when you have impaired um, ventricular function. And the commonest cause of this inflammation in children is infection, be that a virus or a bacteria. And viruses be more common. Non-infectious causes of inflammation are your autoimmune conditions such as lupus and um, uh, inflammation that happens in children post-cardiac surgery called post-pericardial syndrome. Then we look at um, conditions that either increase myocardial demand or decrease supply, such as um, cardiomyopathy, this may be dilated or hypertrophic. Um, conditions which causes obstruction of the left ventricular outflow tract, such as aortic stenosis. This may be at the level of the valve. It may be subvalvar or supervalvar. And arrhythmias also result in chest pain in children. The commonest arrhythmia um, in the, the, the pediatric population is the supraventricular tachycardia. And as we will see, sometimes the children will perceive um, this fast beating of the heart as chest pain. Other causes of um, chest pain in children are your coronary artery abnormalities. This may be congenital. Um, these are rare, but they do happen. Um, Alcapo, that is anomalous origin of the left coronary artery from the pulmonary artery. So the left coronary artery arises from the pulmonary artery and not um, from the aorta. And so one, um, there is decreased supply to that left coronary um, because your pulmonary pressures are much less than your systemic pressure. And you're getting deoxygenated blood, um, which will result in ischemia to the, to the, to the usually to the left ventricle that the left um, coronary supplies. Um, or you may have an anomalous route where the left coronary arises from the right coronary sinus. And to, to move over to the left, it has to traverse between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And sometimes during this course, um, the, the coronary artery can get compressed uh, as it traverses here. Also coronary artery fistulas. Acquired coronary artery abnormalities, you just heard about Kawasaki, the commonest um, acquired heart disease in children, and um, post surgical cases, as well as familial hypercholesterolemia, can cause coronary artery abnormalities. So you have other miscellaneous causes um, aortic dissection, rupture of aortic aneurysm, pulmonary hypertension, mitral valve prolapse. So there's quite a number of, of cardiac causes of, of pediatric chest pain, including drug use. And so your history is going to be quite important in trying to um, decide what is the cause of the, the chest pain in your child. Um, in this study that was done by David Drosno, um, entitled Cardiac Disease in Pediatric Patients, presenting to a pediatric um, emergency department with chest pain. They looked at two tertiary care pediat pediatric emergency departments over a three and a half year period. Um, and they looked at the patient's records for those 19 years and over who presented with chest pain. And were I diagnosed with either cardiac chest pain, non-cardiac chest pain, or had cardiovascular disease at the time. And what they found um, a total of 4,436 patients presented with chest pain. 3% were excluded because of a history of heart disease. And so only 24 or 0.6% of the remaining had um, chest pain of a cardiac origin. The majority having arrhythmias of the supraventricular um, tachycardia type, six patients had a pericarditis or a myocarditis three had an acute MI, one each had a pulmonary embolism and pneumopericardium. Of note, the majority of the patients in that study 
um, were diagnosed with musculoskeletal chest pain. So your history is gonna be key in which pathway you go down um, for, for making a diagnosis in your patients. Um, history and your physical examination. So I will give you some pointers. It's um, not um, set in stone, but these are some of the things that we can look out for. So in your history, you want a description of the pain. Where is it located? Always ask the child if they can tell you to point with one finger to where the pain arises from. Um, is the pain localized or diffused? Diffused chest pain is usually due to um, underlying visceral disease of the lung or the heart, while a localized pain is usually arising from the chest wall. Can they describe the character of the pain to you? Sharp retrosternal pain can indicate a pericarditis, um, while ischemic pain may be described as may be described as squeezing, tightness, pressure constriction, burning, or fullness in the chest. Burning pain can also happen in the, the retrosternal area or in the epigastric area, but if it's temporarily related to food intake, that would more suggest the GERD that we just heard about in those commercials. Now, ischemic chest pain occur in patients who have abnormal um, coronary artery anatomy, um, some that I just alluded to, coronary artery fistulas or stenosis, or a treasure of the coronary artery ostium. Coronary artery abnormalities are second only to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in causing sudden cardiac deaths in adolescents. And I think one of the thing about chest pain in children that everybody wants to know is that is this pain one, due to the heart, and two, is it gonna cause a sudden collapse, a sudden cardiac death? And coronary artery abnormalities and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are the two major causes um, that can lead to sudden cardiac death. Unfortunately, sudden death may be the, the first and only presentation of these conditions. So they may not come complaining of chest pain, um, they may just be a sudden collapse resulting in sudden death if there is not um, appropriate resuscitation that, that takes place. It is usually sensationalized, it's frightening, it's sensational because it usually happens on the football um, field, on the basketball court, by the swimming pool. And so, it, you know, it, it, it's very frightening for it to happen. So these conditions can present for the first time with sudden death and sudden collapse. However, as you do have a significant number of patients who have these abnormal corner artery connections that can present initially with anginal type chest pain as described before, and it's usually associated with exertion. Other things about the pain that you want to know, does the pain radiate? Pain due to myocardial ischemia usually relates to the neck, throat, to the lower jaw, the teeth, upper extremity, or the shoulder. Pericarditis pain usually relates to the left shoulder. And chest pain from aortic dissection frequently relates to the interscapular space in the back. So these are some pointers to guide you as to what could be causing your patient's chest pain. Is your chest pain chronic as opposed to acute? Chronic chest pain is usually non-cardiac in origin and maybe due to other causes such as musculoskeletal or psychogenic. Um, cardiac pain, again, is usually more acute onset, um, ischemic type pain that you, you get. You want to make there any relieving or aggravating factors. If the chest pain is precipitated by exertion and associated with shortness of breath, it's likely cardiac or respiratory and should raise a red flag. Musculoskeletal chest pain usually worsen with certain body positions, movement, and deep breathing. While chest pain that is aggravated by food usually suggests a gastrointestinal cause. Non-exertional chest pain as chest pain that doesn't occur with activities less likely cardiac in origin 
except for pericarditis, but there will be other things in your history that will suggest a pericarditis. You want to know if there's any associated symptoms, palpitation, syncope, dizziness, shortness of breath, exercise intolerance associated with the chest pain. I highlighted these because these are all red flags um, that should make you put cardiac to the top of your differential diagnosis. For palpitations, as I mentioned before, young children will perceive palpitations as chest pain. So if you can get the child to tell you which starts first, does the palpitation start before the chest pain? Then you pay a bit more um, focus on the, the palpitation. Does the chest pain start before the palpitation? You pay a bit more attention to the chest pain because pain is gonna cause your heart to race as, an, as a normal response. Um, so just to bear that, that in mind, if your patient presents with chest pain as well as palpitation, you may be dealing with an arrhythmia. Mitral valve prolapse can also cause a patient to have palpitations. Other um, symptoms, is there any recent infection, such as a respiratory tract infection that might suggest a pericarditis? If the patient is having a recurrent multiple um, pain um, associated with chest pain, headaches, abdominal pain, think psychogenic. Less likely cardiac if they, the, there's associated um, pain elsewhere in the body. Lightheadedness and difficulty breathing um, may suggest anxiety or panic disorder. So I just wanted to, to highlight mitral valve prolapse because it's one of the the cardiac abnormalities that is less likely to cause fatality, but they do present with a, a whole gamut of symptoms. They may present with palpitations, dizziness, fatigue, syncope, panic attacks, some of them or all of them. And it makes, makes you wonder if it is something more serious than it really is. And, and mitral valve prolapse, is not a very serious condition, meaning it's not gonna cause sudden collapse and sudden death. Um, it's also called floppy valve syndrome, click murmur syndrome, or Baller's syndrome is quite common. It's one of the commonest valvular abnormalities, um, can develop at any time, and it's quite associated with genetic disorders, your connective tissue disorders like Marfan's and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So they usually have all of these symptoms and you're wondering what is going on and you get diagnosis of mitral valve prolapse, but there is very limited mitral valve regurgitation. And just, uh, just to remind you what mitral valve prolapse means, it, it, it's the mitral valve leaflet, um, one of the leaflet um, bulges or prolapses into the, the left atrium. So there's poor coaptation between the leaflets um, which will result in mitral valve regurgitation. And this mitral valve regurgitation can be of either mild to severe anywhere along that spectrum. And the symptoms are usually directly related to the mitral valve dysfunction and the severity of the mitral valve regurgitation. Um, and so the frequency of the symptoms due to the MR is usually less in children. And as I said to you before, sudden death is absence, absent in patients with mitral valve prolapse. But yet still, they present with panic attacks, syncope, um, and all the other symptoms previously mentioned. So you have something that is called a mitral valve syndrome, where the pathogenesis of this is not understood, why they have all of these, especially new neuropsychiatric um, symptoms that they tend to get with it. And they think it may occur from a neuroendocrine or automatic or autonomic dysfunction, which again um, is not yet not well understood. Um, so the symptoms that they have is not explained by the valvular abnormality alone. So you might get a report back that says mild mitral valve prolapse, a very trivial regurgitation, but yet still there's chronic chest pain, they're fainting, um, and they have all these neuropsychiatric um, problems. So continuing the history, um, you want to, especially in the adolescents, 
um, see if there's a history of drug use um, because cocaine and other synthetic mimetic drugs are potent vasoconstrictors and they will lead to myocardial ischemia or arrhythmia. You want to find out if there are any psychological stressors. Um, psychogenic chest pain in older children occasionally result from anxiety or a conversion disorder triggered by recent stressors in personal or family life. I can say anecdotally that usually around the time of the grade six exit exam, exam be it GSAC or PEP, you get an increase in patients presenting with, with chest pain just from the, the stress that these children undergo. Um, in a study done by Pantel and Goodman, they reported that approximately a third of adolescents who presented to the outpatient clinic complaining of chest pain had a history of stressful events, either in the family or at school. So always make sure your, your psychological stresses, history of trauma is part of your, your history taking. You also want to look at their past medical history, of course, if they had part history of, of a previous um, congenital heart defect, their post-surgery or some intervention, they are at high risk for coronary artery disease, they have an autoimmune condition, these are red flags that will make you want to, to make sure that there's not a cardiac cause for their chest pain. Looking at the family histories, there are family history of genetic disorders such as connective tissue disorders, Turner syndrome, hypercholesterolemia, arrhythmias, and is there a family history of sudden cardiac death, anyone under 40 or so who died suddenly, no one knew why they died, the patient was not um, ill prior to um, their, their, their demands. So those are just some of the pointers um, to look for in your history. Um, it's not hard and fast. Your history will, will be guided by how the child presents to you. Uh, in your examination, we're looking at some of the things you're looking at, the vital signs. If it's your patient febrile, what is your blood pressure doing? Are they to kidney? Um, suggesting that they may be in heart failure. You look for dysmorphic features. So does this child look like a Turner? So does he look like a Marfan? Um, um, so you'll be, you'll be thinking of mitral valve prolapse, aortic um, root dilatation, um, aortic root dissection, things like that. Is there any chest wall deformity, chest wall tenderness? Always look for chest wall tenderness. I left that there. Always, it's a, it's a non-cardiac cause because usually. When they come referred for an echocardiogram because of chest pain, you lightly put the probe on their chest and they're jumping off the bed. So there is marked chest wall um, tenderness. Sometimes um, they, are, they, are, they are just scared, um, but you can tell the ones who are feigning the, the, the pain and who really have the chest wall tenderness. If there is chest wall tenderness, it is quite unlikely a cardiac cause. And you would do a detailed cardiovascular examination, of course, looking for your pulses, anything that would suggest um, an underlying congenital um, heart defect. Um, and then you will follow this up based on what you have found in your history and examination with a chest X-ray. You may see evidence of cardiomegaly on your chest X-ray. ECG changes of ST segment, ST segment changes on ECG may suggest um, a pericarditis and you request an echocardiogram to see what the structure of the heart looks like if there's a structural cause for the chest pain. Now, treatment is usually reassurance because the majority of the time the chest pain is non-cardiac in, or, in origin. Um, you just want to reassure the parents that the child is not going to have a sudden collapse. They're not going to die suddenly. Um, and the, the, the pain is not arising from the heart. That's basically what I want to know. The heart is fine. Rest analgesia for if it is, you think it's a, a musculoskeletal pain. And depending on what your history and exam and your final examination, you refer to the appropriate um, specialist. Remember, it may be respiratory, it may be GI. 
So you refer to the appropriate specialist. So when do you refer to us, the pediatric cardio cardiologist? This is highly recommended for any child or adolescent patient who has chest pain associated with exertion, especially during exertion or immediately after exertion, um, palpitations, sudden syncope. If there's abnormal findings on a cardiac examination or ECG, a history of past cardiac surgery or intervention, family history of genetic syndrome, arrhythmias or sudden cardiac death, or is there a history of high risk for coronary artery disease? Now your patients with um, Kawasaki who may who have um, coronary artery aneurysms are at risk of getting stenosis and um, ischemia and chest pain. So be aware of those patients who have Kawasaki, they may be um, at risk as well. So in summary, um, take home messages that chest pain in children is usually benign. The rest assured you're not sending home a child who is about to collapse after you have done your detailed history examination and your appropriate investigations. Children with chest pain at its cardiac origin will have symptoms suggestive of such um, and they may have the positive family history and the abnormal findings on investigations. Those are my references. Thank you. Let's not be like this doctor here. Let's do our due diligence to our patients, take our um, history, do our examination, and take it from there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Forrester. And that is such an important topic. As you mentioned, it's highly stressed and a high level of anxiety um, enters the room. The two, both parents come and the grandmother comes and everybody is there with the child because she has chest pain and you know they want everything. And um, so we do have to take, spend a long time on the history. Thank you so much. All right, and thankfully your internet held up. So let's not forget the prayer was, that was given earlier was being answered. So we yeah. have just around uh, 15, 20 minutes more because we're getting out of here at nine o'clock when I do my four minute vote of thanks. So um, we need to do questions and answers now. And let's see now, Sam, be my guy. Do I go into the chat or what do I do? Thanks for the question. So um, there is a question in the Q&A. We're asking everyone to use the Q&A so it's easier to find the, the questions. First question is for speaker one, Dr. Tomlinson Morris. During your presentation, you mentioned that recurrent chest infections can be noted in children with certain cardiovascular defects. I would like to know how many differentiate, I'm sorry, how we can differentiate that specific cardiovascular clinical manifestation as opposed to acute chest syndrome in sickle cell disease, which may also present with recurrent chest infections. This question is from a Dr. Gabriel Lynn or Gabrielle Lynn. So the question is differentiating a cardiac lesion in a patient with sickle cell disease as opposed to acute chest syndrome. That's yes. correct. Okay, so acute chest syndrome basically has um, criteria that that we use to say that um, A, B, C, D, E, and remember, uh, chest infection is, is just one of the things in as part of acute chest syndrome. There's ischemia, um, there's a sickling, etc. So the criteria for acute chest syndrome. Uh, by itself, that's a very interesting question. So acute chest syndrome is a separate entity. While recurrent chest infection is basically a pneumonia, acute chest syndrome includes pneumonia. So if you know the child has a history of sickle cell disease, then you have to just remember all the criteria for acute chest syndrome. Does the child fit into acute chest syndrome? Additionally, does the child have, you know, the child, children with recurrent pneumonias usually have something with like a left to right shunt, like a large VSD and atrioventricular septal defect, 
or any other lesions. So if you suspect that the child has a congenital heart defect, um, then you should go ahead and get the child screened and, and see if the child does have, you know, something that could be contributing to them having recurrent pneumonias, even as part of sickle cell disease. A lot of patients with sickle cell disease do have a murmur, but most of the time it is a flow murmur. So if you are not sure, like I said, send a child for any investigations and, and refer. But usually acute chest syndrome is separate, it's a separate entity, separate and apart from a pneumonia in and of itself. Thank you so much. I'm not seeing any more questions in the Q&A, am I? Yeah, there just were thank you for your answer. I don't think everybody saw them. Um, what is the significance of a pulmonary artery abnormality? Branch stenosis. Right pulmonary artery mild and intraventricular septum abnormality, abnormality ventricular septal defect 25 millimeters with a left to right shunt in a two month old infant. Um, I think that was the first question that was, that was asked. I'm not sure. Right. Hopefully, I didn't butcher it too much. Um, Are you seeing the typed response? I am. So the, the, the answer by Dr. Tomlinson Morris was, generally, it depends on the effect of the lesions. Or, I'm sorry, the effect the lesions are having on the heart, the size of the VSD, and the gradient of the pulmonary artery stenosis. Most babies will have mild pulmonary artery branch stenosis and will resolve few progress, but some have severe stenosis. The VSD size and shunt determines the clinical symptoms. The significance would therefore be what findings are present on examination and the subsequent management. Um, I think there's also another question about a specific pulse oximeter for infants or children. Uh, the answer is yes, there are pulse oximeters for children and babies. As with everything in pediatrics, they tend to be a bit more expensive. Smiley face, NHS, and consumer. Um, I believe those were the questions that were asked before. Um, so let's go back to the Q&A, see if you have anything new. Okay, so here's a quick question from our Rene Rooms. Most of these diseases slash viruses have similar symptoms. Isn't it difficult to know exactly what the patient has? Anyone want to take that question? It's not directly onto that anyway. I think it's speak to me, really. So, um, yeah, <laughs> that is the trick about um, pediatrics, and that's what's lovely about it. It, it involves um, thinking a lot, uh, knowing a lot of these disease conditions, and actually um, um, knowing this pattern. So it's about pattern recognition. So once you recognize patterns, and um, in fact, they call them infectious diseases for a reason. Infection generally tend to jump from patient to patient. So if you don't have that history, sometimes, yes, it might still be infectious, but then you start to think, is it just an infection? Just because you have a fever, does that mean it's an infection? It could be inflammation without an infection. So you know what the season is. You know what the patterns are like. You know the general infections that generally occur during particular seasons, like we have flu seasons and these other seasons and so on and so forth. You know the pattern for respiratory infections. And when it doesn't fall in that pattern, when it's unusual, that's when you start to suspect, is this an air infection? But the air infection with redness without an infusion. And then the lips are red. But when you see these red lips, are they similar to the typical pattern of red lips that you see in other cases? How many conditions do you see with red lips that then crack? Uh, and this, uh, and that is the art of medicine. I hope that helps. Thank you very much. Um, I think it uh, will help. Can I just 
emphasize it. Thank you so much um, for that comment. The art of medicine, Dr. Luweomi, um, very important. And surely most of it must come from the history, just listening carefully. And in the case of um, a child or a family member, hearing what else is happening in the family. Thank you so much for that. I, Sam, I had, to, I had to come in there too. <laughs> No, 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 not at all. Thank you very much. I'm just saying, not seeing any more questions in the Q&A. All right. That's fine. It is late. And if you were like me up very early this morning, it is quarter to, um, to nine almost. Do any of the panelists want to say anything that you thought of? You just want to add a thought? Um, please feel free since we do have a few minutes. But the audience has said the presentations were excellent, all of them, and we have gained so much and such good reminders for us as general practitioners to look out for that child who may just be in the 10% whose chest, chest pain is significant, but by and large, um, we can rest assured it's probably not. Any other comments? Not at this time. All right, so it's my duty now to give the vote of thanks. Is that correct, Sam? Yes. 100%. All right. So it, it has been a pleasurable um, evening going into nightfall. We want to thank, first of all, our presenters. Excellent presentation from our consultant, pediatric um, cardiologist. Good to know at the Bustamante Hospital. And Dr. Olu um, Wemi, Olu Bui, are you at the university or at Bustamante? I wasn't clear. University Hospital. All right, wonderful. And so these are persons we, we would refer our children who we have concerns, cardiac concerns for. So we thank them for giving them their time, taking away them from their family at this hour of the night and um, you know, addressing us, not to mention the hours spent in preparation. So we thank you, Dr. Tamara Tomlinson Morris, Dr. Sharon Forrester, and of course, I'm gonna say Dr. O, o. and I don't think he will mind. All right. Thank you so much to our sponsor, Indus Pharma, as well, uh, reminding us about new gel and amino pep. Thank you so much uh, for the prayer, Dr. Arlene Henry Dawkins. The Lord has heard us as, as you pray. We thank Dr. Semi Onunuju, who gave us a welcome and a reminder that this webinar is presented under the auspices of the Caribbean College of Family Physicians. We definitely cannot forget working in the background, but working very hard, Mrs. Lynn Thomas Hyatt, our CCFP administrator. Thank you so much, of course, to Sam. Sam, we're gonna make you moderator next time. I just love it, you read everything excellently. And he has kept us in touch. All the technology has been working. And, for, and he has responded to those who are dying to do the post test. So um, we thank him for that. We, I think we have covered everybody. Um, it was my pleasure to be your moderator. And I know you thank me, so you don't have to say it. Have a pleasant night. Um, please get going on your post test so that you can get your CMEs. And thanks to all. Have a pleasant night. Pleasant Thank night you. to you as well. Good Thank night. you very much. Excellent moderator. Good night, all.